Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to welcome Mert Sabunku to our video here. So Mert received a PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton University where his dissertation dealt with biomedical image registration. Mert then moved to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for a postdoc at Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, where he worked on a range of biomedical image analysis problems, including the segmentation of brain MRI scans. After his postdoc at MIT, Mert was a faculty member of the A.A. Martinez Center for Biomedical Imaging in the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where he built a research program on algorithmic tools for integrating large-scale genetics and medical imaging datasets. Today, Mert is Associate Professor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Cornell and Cornell Tech in New York City. His research group develops machine learning based and computational tools for biomedical image applications and he is also the recipient of an NSF career award that he was awarded in 2018 and an NIH Early Career Development Award in 2011. So Mert is going to present us today really cool stuff about uh, compressed sensing and how to integrate deep learning with that. You will see he has really a lot of smart ideas. So I'm really glad that he's here today with us. What you'll also see is that I actually have been traveling while we did the recording. So I have been in a hotel room in Montreal, Canada. So it's really great that we can travel again. And you'll see that now I'm back and we can finally upload this video and you will be able to enjoy Mert's presentation. So Mert, without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks for the kind intro. Um, it's great to be here. I just was thinking, when's the last time I gave a full talk like this? And it's been a while, uh, about almost a year now. So um, I might be a little rusty, um, but um, here it goes. So today I'm going to talk about compressed imaging or compressed sensing for imaging. Um, before I dive in, I want to, there's a couple PR slides. Um, I just recently moved to um, New York City. Um, where uh, we, Cornell University has a couple campuses. Our brand new campus, our newest campus in New York City is called Cornell Tech. It's a, sort of a unique uh, graduate education campus with, with a sort of a societal impact and outreach mission. Uh, my primary lab space and office space is uh, uh, at this campus. It's uh, on Roosevelt Island. For those of you who are familiar with New York City, it's on Roosevelt Island. Um, right next to uh, Manhattan, and we have uh, wonderful views of Manhattan skyline. Um, and uh, and yeah, so this is sort of what it looks like. Um, it's uh, construction just recently, the first phase of its construction completed, like three years ago, I think, right now. Um, and um, and we have another phase that's coming up in five years. Um, Cornell also has a medical campus in New York. It's on the Upper East Side of uh, Manhattan uh, on 69th and 1st in New York. Um, and it's called Wild Cornell Medicine. So we have the medical school and we have the affiliated hospital, which is New York Presbyterian. Um, and I also have an affiliation with the medical school and I also have a lab space um, at the medical campus as well. Okay, so that was sort of a little bit of PR. Um, so just a couple of disclaimers. I consult for a company called Clearly. Um, none of the work that I'm going to talk about, I think, today in, uh, involves any or is related to anything that we do at Clearly. So that's not really very relevant. Um, but I sort of need to still dis disclose my financial conflicts of interest. Um, and another thing is we actually filed for a patent for some of these ideas that we discussed today. So, um, so that's relevant. Okay. All right. Um, 
I don't, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but essentially biomedical imaging is exploding, right? So it's growing uh, in size, you know, and ubiquity. Um, it's becoming cheaper for us to get scans. Um, there are larger and larger data sets out there now for us to sort of um, do analysis on. Um, and a lot of that uh, progress is both in the context of healthcare and also in the service of biomedical sciences, right? Um, and it's fueled by developments in hardware, right? So we are getting uh, we are getting much better, uh, more sophisticated hardware that gives us these um, beautiful looking images at lower and lower prices. My um, research program or my lab is really not a hardware lab. Uh, we're on the computational side of things, so. Essentially, we take the images um, that are acquired by these sort of um, machines and we apply software to them um, for various uh, objectives. Uh, on one side, we're interested in um, accelerating the imaging. So basically developing software that could be integrated into the acquisition um, that would enable us to acquire faster imaging or more high quality imaging. Um, and then we have sort of more image processing tasks like once you have an image, you form the image and you're sort of looking for objects of interest or you're trying to measure things in an image. Um, and then finally, we have more downstream uh, applications like um, can we quantify the success of a treatment? Can we make predictions about the patient's future clinical outcome based on what we see in their image kind of things? Okay, so my research involves the entire spectrum of this, right? We work on um, the acquisition side, all the way down to sort of the clinical workflow and prognostication type of questions. But today though, I'm gonna mainly be focused on the earlier question of acquisition and speeding up acquisition. And in accelerating imaging, we essentially have two approaches. Uh, one is the so-called parallel imaging approach where you're essentially deploying multiple sensors to acquire the signal in parallel. Um, and obviously that requires a hardware modification. Uh, and then we have the so-called compressed sensing approach, which is more of a software approach. It's not really a hardware approach. Um, and obviously you can, the most successful acceleration techniques today combine these two techniques, right? You uh, do parallel imaging in conjunction with compressed sensing. That said, most of my talk is essentially going to be about compressed sensing. So I'm going to sort of ignore parallel imaging, not because I don't think it's important, but just because I'm not a hard work person and I'm not involved in that kind of research. But, and, and furthermore, a lot of the techniques that we talk about today can easily be applied to the context of parallel imaging. Okay, so here's the sort of a, a rough outline of the rest of the talk. First, I'll introduce the basic concept of compressed sensing. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, with compressed sensing. You, you're probably more experts than me, but I'll, I'll just make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'll, contact, you know, I'll instantiate compressed sensing in the context of MRI. Uh, I'm sure most of you are ex uh, experts of MRI. Um, and, and so that's gonna be a very simple basic intro. Uh, and then I'll introduce Loop, which uh, is at this point a couple years old, uh, but it's our first sort of serious attempt at using deep learning for compressed sensing imaging. Um, it, and Loop stands for optimizing the undersampling pattern or learning-based optimization of the undersampling pattern. It's a general purpose idea, but we sort of, uh, we sort of, the way we first implemented it was in the context of MRI, so I'll present it in that context. And then I'll talk about how we recently extended Loop it to apply to microscopy, uh, specifically fluorescence microscopy. Uh, and then I'll shift gears and really uh, talk more about just the reconstruction problem and not just not the compressed sensing side, but once you have the undersampled data, how do you reconstruct from them and solve that ill-posed inference problem? And, and I'll talk about some recent um, sort of innovations that we've made on that front. And then I'll conclude with a quick discussion. Okay. So I teach DSP at Cornell, um, and this is something I spend quite a while on, at least two weeks on sampling theory and, and associated sort of problems like aliasing. Um, and essentially we have a well-established theory all the way that dates you know, over a hundred years now um, that really is um, telling us how to 
um, sample a signal in a way that we can faithfully reconstruct it. So um, if you have this analog signal, this continuous time signal, let's say, uh, and you sampled it uniformly, um, acquiring these sort of discreetly indexed uh, measurements, um, there's actually a guarantee on uh, recovering this original analog signal if a condition is satisfied. And that condition is the sampling rate, uh, the rate at which you're sampling is at least twice the bandwidth of your signal, where bandwidth is basically defined in the, you know, using the classical Fourier transform. Um, and basically everything, uh, if you look at the Fourier transform of your signal, uh, the, you're basically saying that the signal has a zero, um, zero value components above that bandwidth frequency, okay? Now, that's great, um, but one thing we don't really talk too much about unless we get into compressed sensing is that uh, under certain conditions, we can actually do better than this. We don't have to sample at this rate. We can undersample and still to some extent recover or approximate our original signal. And sort of the intuition here is that if we know more about our signal, if we've seen examples of our signal in the past, or we know something about our signal, um, like, you know, it's sparse in the wavelength domain, for instance, um, then we can use that kind of prior knowledge to get away with less samples and, and, and approximate our original signal with a, a from, from these discretely indexed samples that are, um, that are collected with a rate that is lower than the Nyquist rate. So this undersampling essentially results in a so-called impose inverse linear problem. Okay, so what we want is this long vector X, this column vector X, which represents the discrete samples collected at the Nyquist rate, let's say. Um, but what we measure is this sort of shorter vector Y, and there's often a simple sort of linear relationship between Y and X that is captured with this um, short fat matrix D, okay? Now, if we're literally just undersampling X, this D matrix is, uh, is basically a bunch of, you know, what hot encoded columns, if you will, okay? Um, that tells us which um, rows of X to pick. Now, um, the problem is we don't observe X. We know what D is by construction. We measure the Ys and the goal of the game is to get the X. Okay, um, and the only way we can actually solve this imposed problem is to, and, and obviously, sorry, I should state this, I guess, more explicitly is there's infinitely many X's out there in the world that would satisfy this forward model that would basically, if we pre-multiplied it with D, we would get the Y that is consistent with our measurements. Um, so to solve this imposed inverse problem, we essentially have to impose a prior, right? We have to adopt some sort of um, model or loss function that, tells us what the good X's are and what the, what the more sort of expected X's are, okay? And the way you sort of classically solve this is you essentially encode this prior into a regularized regression problem, essentially, where you have the forward model, again, Y equals the X, and you, um, you are measuring Y and you're looking for the X, um, and you have a so-called regularization loss function or some sort of log prior term that tells us what the good X's are and what the bad X's are. So for a good X, this term will be lower. Um, and you solve this rigorized regression problem or, or rigorized least squares problem if you're using L2 loss on the on data consistency term. Now, this is how you classically solve compressed sensing. You basically give me a Y, I know what D is, I sort of craft a regularization term and I solve this optimization problem using whatever optimization strategy I want, okay? Um, common regularization terms include things like total variation or sparse, uh, sparsely inducing norms on wavelet coefficients. Um, but that's essentially a sort of the summary of compressed sensing up until let's say two or three years ago um, where deep learning took off, okay? So we would basically formulate the problem as, a, as this rigorized regression problem, okay? And, and that entire sort of field of research that spanned over a decade basically was about finding better optimizers, finding better regularizers, and even sometimes finding better um, data consistency curves. All right, so let's sort of switch gears and talk a little bit about MRI. So um, as you probably all know, MRI is an imaging modality 
um, that is not acquired in the so-called image domain or the spatial domain. So it's not like a typical photo where we have a spatially organized uh, array of photoreceptors, but instead it's an imaging modality that's acquired in the Fourier domain. So due to the sort of the interesting um, you know, complexities of MR physics, we actually are measuring things in k-space. That's the um, frequency space. Um, and we get sort of measurements that are complex valued in k-space that we then have to inverse, take the inverse Fourier of to uh, reconstruct our image in the spatial domain that looks like this. This is sort of a, a slice of a brain MRI scan or a head MRI scan, C1 weighted. Now, um, so the relationship between the actual measurements and the actual image is basically through the Fourier transform, okay? So if we wanted to undersample in, in the MRI acquisition, um, what we would need to do is we would need to collect less samples in the k-space or in the Fourier domain. Um, so if we start out with a fully sampled k-space, that is if we wanted to reconstruct an image of let's say 256 by 256, um, then we would need to sample at a 256 by 256 grid in k-space. Um, so if we actually fully measured every point in that grid and then applied the inverse Fourier transform to it, we get this crisp looking nice image, okay? Um, on the other hand, if we actually undersample k-space, let's say we skip every few lines in the k-space um, grid um, and then zero fill everything that we did not measure uh, before applying the inverse Fourier transform, um, this is what the image would look like that we would reconstruct. It would have this sort of, aliasing artifact that we call, uh, where essentially sort of different copies of the shifted original image get superimposed and, um, and sort of that's what you observe, which is kind of like a ghosting artifact, which is um, theoretically very hard to disentangle. So, you know, you can sort of recognize that there's this underlying brain, so some underlying image here that, um, you know, some copies of which have been superimposed, but um, without any prior knowledge about that image, you wouldn't be able to sort of resolve that image perfectly, okay? So the, the key insight here is we really need some prior knowledge about the image to be able to resolve these alias, um, art, resolve these alias artifacts. Um, people observed um, over a decade ago that instead of doing like a regular undersampling, like skipping lines, we actually did some random looking undersampling. So we, uh, undersampled in k-space, the red dots here represent what we were measuring and everything else is not measured. Um, and then again, applied our zero filling to things that weren't measured and applied our inverse Fourier transform, we would get an image that might look like this. Okay, so here the aliasing artifacts are less regular looking or, uh, and, and, and the thought might be that uh, it might be easier to clean this up. So the artifacts are not as bad, although maybe we have a better example here where instead of uniform undersampling, we uh, again apply some random looking undersampling, but instead of uh, applying it uniformly over K space, we concentrate it in the middle of K space, which corresponds to the low frequency component of this K space uh, and sample less in the outer edges of K space, which are the high frequency components of K space. Um, and then do zero failing and inverse Fourier, and we might get an image like this. So this just qualitatively tells us that undersampling in a way that's sort of random looking and maybe concentrated in the center of case space might be a good idea because the artifacts that we obtain um, seem like uh, things that we might be able to clean up with decent prior knowledge, okay? So that was basically observation that led to compressed sensing MRI in 2007, 2008, so 14 years ago now, uh, by Michaelistic and colleagues. Um, and essentially, they proposed to undersample k-space using something like this, a variable density type undersampling pattern. Um, and then they sort of, we have this forward model now. So you have the original image that you want to reconstruct. You apply forward Fourier transform to it, which is the F matrix here. You undersample it. This is sort of the, uh, the sort of the represents the red dots where you're collecting those Fourier transform coefficients. Uh, and that's the measurements that you obtain, right? So this is your forward model. And from that forward model, you really want, you get Y, you have Y, the measurements, you have, you know what U is, you know what F is, that's by construction, and you wanna get X, 
So the way you would solve it back then would be you would set it up as a regularized regression problem. And basically, you would have this L2 loss term, which is a data consistency term, plus a regularizer that encourages a solution that looks like what you would expect. Okay, So different types of regularizers, as I mentioned before, you might have a sparsely inducing norm like L1 on wavelets. Um, you might have a total variation kind of um, regularizer that basically says the edges in my images need to be sparse, sort of with an L1 norm on the gradient image. OK. Um, so you would basically solve this optimization problem for any given Y. So you collect data in your MRI scanner, and then you sort of uh, you know, apply your favorite optimizer uh, uh, to, this, to this problem. Um, and most of that research involved, you know, looking at different optimizers, looking at different um, regularizers, and, and, and looking at um, different um, sort of reconstruction, or not reconstruction, but um, the data consistency terms. Okay. Now, what happened maybe around the, like four years ago or so now um, was the emergence of um, deep learning in, in medical imaging and, and the, I, the realization that you could actually apply deep learning to this problem as well. Um, and the way you want to think about this is um, basically in the classical formulation, you solve the reconstruction problem um, from scratch anytime you give me a new Y. Okay, but in the context of a deep learning based approach is you're given a bunch of data beforehand, your training data. Um, and these training data could be a bunch of Y's or it could actually be a bunch of X's. Okay, so it could be fully sampled data that you're given um, during training or it could be just under sampled data that you're giving during training. And basically you're training a neural network to go from y to x. So a neural network is essentially a function that takes you from y to x. Um, and that, that, that neural network architecture could have all sorts of different shapes and forms. Um, there's been kind of a, a rich uh, literature on this where people have proposed um, different architectures that are inspired by the different optimizers used in the classical formulation by unrolling the iterations of those optimizers. But also more generic architectures like the unit also can seem to work well for this type of problem. But essentially what you're doing in this is you're amortizing the optimization problem. So instead of solving the optimization from scratch anytime you give me a new Y, um, you're sort of using the offline training to figure out how to efficiently solve for, a, for any given Y, right? So you're trying to figure out how to amortize that optimization problem. Okay. Now, one thing that up until, let's say, 2017 or so, that people didn't really pay a ton of attention to was the undersampling pattern, right? So there was this qualitative observation that the variable density pattern that looked random and concentrated on low frequencies was uh, seemed to be a good idea. It, you know, if you just did zero filling and did the inverse Fourier transform, you got an image that looked like you could clean it up. And if you applied, you know, compressed sensing techniques like rigorized regression or even the neural network based approaches to these images, um, the reconstruction you got was pretty good. Uh, but there was really very little on trying to figure out what the optimal undersampling should be. Um, there's obviously a couple of exceptions, right? So up until 2019 or so, there was a few, I think, um, solid attempts at trying to optimize the undersampling mask. Um, for example, early on in 2011, Noel and colleagues um, re recognized that um, you could actually, if you gave me a fully sampled image uh, that a representative example of the types of, types of images that you might see in the future, and you looked at the power spectrum of that image, so the magnitude of the Fourier transform, and then you concentrated your sampling onto um, the coefficients that had high power, um, that seemed to yield a better undersampling pattern. Um, and the thinking there was that um, the, the L2 loss, the thing that you care about potentially in the quality of the reconstruction um, is you know, through Parsifal's Parsifal theorem, we know that uh, a lot of the energy is concentrated uh, or, or a lot of the L2 loss is contributed by the um, Fourier coefficients that carry a lot of the energy. Um, and 
also the inter- the variation across data uh, across the different subjects across different anatomies uh, is actually in the phase it's not in the magnitude so if you actually measure the t- acquire measurements at these high magnitude locations in the Fourier domain uh, and get those phase values correctly then you do a good job in in reconstruction and capturing that um, that individual anatomy okay um, there was a couple of other approaches, um, like uh, an early approach by Seeger and colleagues that sort of try to, in real time, optimize the trajectory without any prior knowledge. But as you're acquiring the data, you sort of, uh, in a greedy fashion, you figure out what the next acquisition should be in case space. Um, and um, Justin Holder and, and Kim uh, in 2019 proposed another technique uh, that they call Oedipus, which was based on the Kramer rare bound and really was a general purpose sort of uh, optimization for undersampling, which was ignorant to or agnostic to, I, I should say, to how you reconstruct from the data, what kind of you know reconstruction technique you use, whether it's a neural network or, or an optimi- optimization strategy or not. It didn't really care because the Kramer rare bound is just this general universal upper bound on the variance of your estimator. And thus you, they could derive um, uncertainty values for different um, different uh, undersampling m- m- patterns, and 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 that's how they optimize the undersampling pattern. Now, what's sort of not being considered in any of this prior work was that um, you could potentially assume that you have lots and lots of training data, fully sampled training data, um, to leverage and figure out what uh, you know, figure out the undersampling pattern from them. Okay, and the other thing that that is kind of key to me is that the optimization of the undersampling pattern should be coupled to the up, the the reconstruction technique, right? You you um, there is like depending on how you reconstruct from the undersampling data, undersampled data, um, maybe there's different sort of optimal patterns. So um, to me, there's a couple problems, right? The undersamp optimizing the undersampling mask and and the, and, and the reconstruction method. For example, if you consider a toy example where like the data that you're collecting, uh, if you look at it in the Fourier domain, imagine that there's this one Fourier coefficient that is always constant. It's just, you know, it never changes. Well, if your reconstruction method knows that, you know, it can reliably impute that missing value, then there's no need to sample that value, right? So, uh, but that depends on whether your reconstruction method knows that or not, right? And in general, if your reconstruction method can recover some of the missing values, the better they, it can do at recovering some of the missing values, the more we can afford not to sample those values, okay? And, and this is not a univariate decision. And, you know, I know my toy example was univariate. I, I was focusing on a single Fourier coefficient, but you can imagine that there might be multivariate sort of relationships that your reconstruction method might be able to exploit in order to impute some of the missing data. Now, if you look at this problem naively, it's a very, very challenging problem. Take a you know a grid size of G by G, a sparsity level of X, um, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out the, you know uh, you're you're basically searching over this um, um, G square choose S solution space, right? So out of all possible G square masks, you know that sort of out of uh, the G square locations in K space that I'm going to sample through, I need to choose S of them to, to be able to sample from, right? That's my sparsity level. And, and there's so many combinations that I can do. So I need to sort of consider all of them. And for every possible con- con- combination, I want to be able to, you know, reconstruct from undersampled data and look at the quality of that reconstruction and decide whether that was a good mask or not, and then optimize over all possible masks, right? So as you can imagine, this is like a, a very, very um, difficult optimization problem. In fact, if you just do like a, a simple back of the envelope kind of math, it's, it's infeasible. It takes 10 to the thousand years to solve in brute force for you know, making some very sort of basic assumptions about the data. Um, and so even um, if you had like eternity, you wouldn't be able to solve some of these problems. And, and the question is, what do we do then, right? And if you look at what engineers do to the in these types of situations, is they they relax this integer problem, right? So this integer optimization problem that we have, which is inherently uh, complex, can be relaxed um, and and turned into two nested optimizations. Okay, and that's going to be our approach. Um, we're basically uh, again, as a reminder, we're trying to optimize the mask of, uh, of 
the undersampling uh, to in order to maximize reconstruction accuracy. And we're going to take a machine learning based approach. Uh, we're going to assume that we have a bunch of fully sampled data. So we have a bunch of X's uh, and we're going to apply retrospective undersampling to these data. Um, and for every possible undersampling of our data, we're going to feed it through a reconstruction neural network that is amortizing our compressed sensing optimization problem um, and uh, computing efficiently reconstructions for us that we can then comp compare back to our original uh, fully sampled data and, and, and just do end-to-end -end optimization of this. Okay, so this is sort of an overview, right? So you start with ground truth, fully sampled data. You apply for Fourier transform to it. This is the original fully sampled case-based measurements. Um, you then apply some candidate undersampling to this, uh, which gives you the measurement data. And then you apply zero filling, inverse Fourier. And then there's this A um, neural network that we denote with A, which is what we call the anti-aliasing neural network that cleans this guy up and turns it into a crisp looking MRI scan that we then look uh, and compare to a fully sampled original ground truth MRI scan. And this entire pipeline will be trained based on the difference between the input and the final output reconstruction. Okay, and this is what we call learning based optimization of the undersampling pattern or loop. Okay, so just walking through that reconstruction. And this is how we implement this whole thing. So this is just the conceptual diagram of what we think you know, how we think about the problem, but um, this is how we implement it, right? So the input image comes in, you know, there's a bunch of layers. These are, these are not learned. Uh, there's the, you know, the Fourier transform layer. Um, and, and then there's this part of the, which is the undersampling mask. We start with um, weight parameters that are uh, uh, unrestricted. Uh, so it can go from minus infinity to infinity. Then we um, turn them into probability values. Uh, so at every case based location, there's a probability of sampling, uh, which we call the probabilistic mask. Then we sample from that. So at every case based location, we independently sample from these probability values to create a binary mask, which we then apply as an element wise product to our fully sampled case based data, which gives us an undersampled case based data, which we then zero fill, inverse Fourier transform, get an image that has aliasing artifacts in it. And then we feed this to a unit. This is a generic unit neural network. Um, and that computes or that cleans up the aliasing artifacts and creates a, a nice looking reconstruction for us. And this unit has, the parameters of this unit are learned from scratch. Um, and the other thing that's learned is the sort of the probabilistic mask weight, okay? So that walks through, um, sorry, this is the original full space, full resolution case-based image. This is a binary mask that was sampled from the learned case, from the learned probabilistic mask. This is the zero field inverse Fourier transform, that image that has aliasing artifacts in it, uh, et cetera. Okay, so this is a loss function that we train the whole thing on. Um, basically, we're trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to, um, we're, there are two things that we're optimizing. One is the probabilistic masks, uh, the probabilities of the, of the mask. Um, and the other one is the parameters of the anti-aliasing neural network, which is our unit. Uh, and we're optimizing this over the expected sort of loss between the reconstruction and, and the input full resolution image. Uh, and we're taking an expectation over all possible realizations of the binary mask, right? So here the sum is over data points over our training data. And the expectation here is over the, um, the random draws from the probabilistic mask, okay? Um, A theta denotes the anti aliasing network that the unit is, is parameters are theta. Um, this is the inverse Fourier transform. This is the undersampling that's applied for, by the, diagonal, the, by the um, binary mask. This is the forward Fourier transform. This F here, the XJ is our original fully sampled data. Uh, XJ is, again, we're comparing. So this whole thing here is the reconstruction. That's the output of our network. We're comparing it to the input and we're minimizing, let's say, L1 loss. Okay, that's an arbitrary choice. We tried different things like L2 and SSM and et cetera, but um, L1 loss is the one that I'm gonna present results with, okay? And there's one other condition. Uh, this is a constraint optimization problem. On average, we wanna we want fix our sparsity level. We wanna fix the number of samples we collect uh, in our undersampling. And, and the way we achieve that is we basically say the L1 norm of our probabilistic mask equals the sparsity level, okay? So on, on expectation, this says, this basically guarantees that the mask will have um, an alpha ratio of ones in it, okay? 
Now we can't optimize this obviously because there's an expectation here, but we can approximate that with Monte Carlo samples, right? So we can draw several Monte Carlo samples of the binary mask from these probabilistic values uh, and, and, and compute the um, empirical average of that and minimize that. And, and the other thing, so as we're minimizing this, one thing we need to do is compute the um, derivative of this loss term with respect to the probability values P uh, and the probability values P, the way it sort of enters the equation is it basically dictates the, the, pro the probability of these binary masks, right? So um, that is something that you can't do in a straightforward manner. Uh, and one way to achieve that is through the reparameterization trick, uh, which I'm not gonna really spell out here, but you've sort of replaced that um, Bernoulli sampling with a uniform sampling. Um, and you end up with this thresholding operation here, which you can relax um, using um, something like a logistic function, which basically corresponds to uh, kind of like the gun belt softmax relaxation. All right. Um, the other thing I want to point out um, is we have a normalization layer that sort of uh, solves this constraint optimization for us. So remember, we have this constraint that the average PL1 norm, sorry, the L1 norm of the P, uh, the probabilistic mask has to be alpha. That's our sparsity level. Um, and we, the way we do that is we essentially solve it unconstrained first. So we're basically computing gradients for an unconstrained probability mask. And then we rescale the probability mask uniformly to make sure that the average value is alpha. Okay, this is the normalization layer. A couple of implementation details. Um, we relax the thresholding operation with the sigmoid. We randomly draw a single Monte Carlo sample uh, in that Monte Carlo step. Um, this is, you know, in, a, in you know, to, to my Bayesian sensibilities, it's blasphemy, but uh, in the context of deep learning, we know the power of stochastic gradient descent, and we know that as long as the gradients that we're computing are unbiased, even though they're very, very noisy, uh, it seems to uh, do well. So we sort of, in practice, tried k equals one, and we did really well. So we stuck with that, which is very common in, in sort of stochastic layers in neural networks. They just, you know, people often just use k equals one as their sample. Um, we used Adam as our optimizer. We used early stepping and all the code. Original code was in TensorFlow. We've actually got recent code in PyTorch as well. All right. Um, so I'll, I'll present two sets of experiments. One is brain MRI scans. The other one is knee MRI scans. Um, so in the brain MRI scans, we um, looked at a bunch of different data sets, but um, I'm presenting results from the by data set here which is, uh, contains um, T1-weighted brain MRI scans of two fifty-six squared slices. Uh, we'll use 100 of them for training, which is basically the, these are the data that we use to optimize the parameters of our neural network and the probability masks. Uh, 50 of those were validation data that was used for early stopping, essentially. And then 10 test subjects were sort of separately hauled. Um, for just evaluating the performance of our models. And by the way, when I say test subjects, I mean the entire volume of each test subject. So there's um, many slices in the volume of each test subject. Okay. Um, now, there are different types of reconstruction methods out there in the world, right? So there are ones that sort of predate neural networks like BM3D, um, uh, you know, regularized regression based techniques like TGV and shearlet transforms, Aloha. Um, these are sort of tools that we found that are not neural network based, um, but optimization based strategies for reconstruction, um, but they're sort of freely available code that people seem to be using a lot. And so we sort of can use in our own experiments as well. And we also had a residual unit, which is, which is essentially the same neural network architecture that we relied on in loop um, as a reconstruction method. Um, and we considered different undersampling masks um, the variable density mass that looks like this, we have a so-called calibration region in the center of the case space. Uh, we have results for both with and without this, but, um, but it seems to work well with, with the calibration region. So I'm just gonna show those results um, where basically your density is sampling the center of case space in a square like this. Um, this, is, this is a common practice when you have multi-coil or parallel MRI. Um, in single call MRI, you, don't, you really don't need this calibration region, but um, it seems to work well in our experiments. So we just kept it. 
Um, this is variable density. This is uniform sampling, just uniform sampling everywhere. This is what we call Cartesian sampling. So we're just taking sort of these lines uh, and skipping lines in K space. And these are the, what the optimized uh, mass look like for loop. So loop discovered that for 10% sparsity, you have an optimized uh, mass like this. And for 5% sparsity, you have an optimized mass that looks like this. Um, and you sort of realize that it's like a variable density mass. It concentrates in the center of K space uh, and sort of decays as you move away to the, to the fringes. Um, but it's not exactly like a Gaussian. Uh, to me, it, it kind of looks like a, a, like a disk in the center, a, a denser disk in the center, and a sort of a less dense disk uh, superimposed on top of that, and maybe uniform in the background. Uh, we didn't really try to fit a parametric model to this, uh, which could be interesting. But um, uh, And then uh, so if you look at some quantitative results, uh, just overall quality of the, of, of, of the reconstructions are much better for the loop optimized mask. Um, and um, you can, and this interestingly holds if you apply the loop optimized mask with other reconstruction methods like BM3, TGV, and Aloha. And this, to some extent, it, it contradicts something I said early on, which is um, I had this hypothesis that the optimization of the undersampling mask should depend on the reconstruction method. Um, in this case, uh, our experiments suggest that the optimization, the, the mask that we optimize for a unit based reconstruction um, seem to work well for other uh, reconstruction methods as well. Here are some visuals that I am not gonna spend a lot of time on, but just qualitatively, you can appreciate that, for instance, the, the boundary, the, the, the edge of the putamen is visible for the reconstruction that we obtained from the optimized mask, but it was sort of blurred out with the other masks. Uh, similarly, you can sort of resolve some of the anatomical details in a knee MRI scan um, better when you look, use a loop optimized mask rather than just these generic masks that people use. Um, if you actually did a side-by-side -side comparison between um, the optimized masks, as I said, we had two sets of experiments. One was with brain data, the other one was knee data. Um, in the knee data, we observed that there was a different shape uh, of mass that emerged. Uh, these are both the same sparsity level. So the number of black dots in this, in this image are the same as the number of black dots in this image. But interestingly, this, the brain image is radially symmetric, uh, whereas the knee image is not. And, uh, and I believe, uh, I hypothesize that this is probably due to this sort of the orientation of a lot of the edges in the knee MRI scan, where you have these up and down, more of these up and down edges, where as in the brain anatomy, it's much more radially symmetric if you look at the edge, edge contour map. So um, I basically what I did was I presented loop, um, which is uh, something that we started working on a few years ago now, and we published last year, um, and uh, and we've sort of extended in different directions. Um, it's an end-to-end -end learning for undersampling, the undersampling pattern in compressed sensing, and we we early on start out in the context of MRI. Uh, and interesting, some interesting results is that the loop optimized uh, masks were um, seem to depend on the anatomy, right? Which is not surprising, I presume. It depends on the con on the content of the image. Um, the other thing was that the loop optimized masks seem to work well with different sort of good quality reconstruction methods. Obviously, if you had a reconstruction method that sucked, then presumably um, it wouldn't make a big difference with whether you use the loop optimized mask or a different mask. Uh, but with a good quality reconstruction method, the loop optimized mask would work better than other masks. Um, the caveat of our work so far was that we did not consider the actual acquisition cost, right? So a proxy for acquisi acquisition cost in the MRI sp uh, case space was the number of samples that we collected. Obviously, that doesn't reflect the true time that it takes to measure those um, or acquire those case-based measurements. Um, and there's been some recent work that actually built on loop um, that extended this into uh, into uh, in, into incorporating the physical cost of the MRI sequence. Uh, the other thing I, I want to briefly mention is that the, the primarily the result, the results I presented used an L1 loss on reconstruction quality. Obviously, you can use other types of loss functions uh, as well. OK, so we extended loop in different ways. We actually applied loop uh, prospectively uh, in the MRI scanner, which we have a, a publication on that I'm not going to talk about. 
But more recently, we actually took this idea and applied it to fluorescence microscopy that I'll briefly highlight here. Um, fluorescence microscopy is a very widespread imaging technique in biology. Um, essentially, what it involves is use often genetically engineered tissue sample um, to uh, emit fluorescence uh, when you sort of uh, shine light on it. Um, and, um, and, and, and then you acquire sort of optical images. Um, and the way that it's quite a noisy modality. So you often have to wait, you know, emit a lot of shine, a lot of light on the, onto the sample and wait a long time to acquire the, the, the light that bounces back or that the light, the light is sorry, um, emitted by the fluorescence. Um, and, and, you know, that's how, you know, that's how the imaging is done. And there's like a lot of Poisson noise and Gaussian noise involved in the imaging. Okay, and the way you sort of uh, increase your SNR is you basically um, take a lot of images. That's that's how it is, and that obviously costs a lot of time. And every time you're acquiring the images, you're sort of shining light onto the sample. And the more light you shine onto the sample, the 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 worse it, it is for for the biological tissue. Right? There's these photo bleaching effects that you you want to avoid. Um, so people have looked at compressed sensing in fluorescence microscopy. And it turns out that the, the most common way to do compressed sensing in fluorescence microscopy is, is via the so-called Hadamard bases. So um, the Hadamard bases look like these. They're these checkerboard-like kind of patterns where um, what's, you know, this is, let's say this is the entire tissue sample and anything that's white is where you're shining light onto and, and then measuring from. And anything that's black is you're sort of not shining light onto, you're covering that tissue sample. And so, you basically apply these different Hadamard patterns, collect the data, uh, and um, if you apply, if you acquire data from the full Hadamard bases, um, you have a regular inverse transform that you can apply and, and reconstruct the original image. But in the context of compressed sensing, obviously you want to acquire from not all the bases, but you know you want to um, avoid uh, all you know most most of these bases and just measure some of them. Um, and you end up with this ill-posed inverse problem like you did before, uh, as, as in the MRI case. Um, and, uh, and you have to solve that compressed sensing problem, okay? Or this reconstruction problem. So it's basically the same uh, setup as the MRI, but um, instead of case space, we have these Hadamard measurements. And instead of a single case space measurement, we have potentially multiple measurements per Hadamard basis. Uh, and we have a slightly different noise model. We have the Gaussian and Poisson noise model to, to think about. But essentially, uh, the, the, the general framework is the same. We start out with fully sampled data, and we're trying to figure out the uh, number of measurements that we have to acquire from each hand of our bases in a way that would optimize for our, the quality of our reconstruction um, with a, a sort of a constant um, budget for undersampling. Okay, so the undersampling or the sparsity ratio is going to be constant. This is our constraint in our optimization problem. And, and so if we sort of do end-to-end -end learning on our data, this is what we observe. So this is what a lot of people use. They use what's called low sequence. So here we've sort of reorganized the Hadamard bases uh, in a rectangular or in a, in, a, in a square form. And anything to, that's closer to the upper left is kind of like the low frequency components or what we call low sequency in the Hadamard world. Uh, and this is sort of the common uh, pattern that people using press sensing uh, in the, using Hadamard bases for fluorescence microscopy, um, they either do low sequency like this uh, or uniform, okay? Or sometimes half and half, which is there's this constant low sequency region and then there's uniform in the rest, okay? Um, and when we apply loop to our data and there was two different ways of applying loop to our data, essentially it didn't make a big difference in terms of the results. Uh, one was where, where we simulated the noise and one was where we actually used some raw measurements uh, for instead of the noise model. Um, but we essentially learn a optimal um, undersampling pattern that looks like this. And it's neither low sequency nor half and half nor uniform, right? So it's something in between, okay? And just qualitatively and quantitatively as well. So if you have this sort of full resolution microscopy images on the left, and these are the, so the reconstructed microscopy images on the right with, with 10x undersampling. We observe that compared to other undersampling patterns and compared to other reconstruction methods, uh, our results are the best. Okay. Now, 
in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to switch gears and, and forget about the undersampling problem for a second, which um, I think we've done a good job at sort of, um, uh, making progress on, uh, but focus more on the reconstruction problem. Okay, so somebody gave us some undersampled data, and from those data, we want to solve the Ilpo's inverse problem. Okay, now if you look at these, the, the deep learning based compressed sensing literature right now, um, a lot of the focus is actually on the reconstruction problem, and a lot of the focus is actually on designing the architecture. Okay, so how like different architectural design choices, you know, inspired by the old generation optimizers. Okay, and I believe that the more important question here is not actually the architectural design, but it's the choice of the loss function. Okay, so in the so the remainder of the talk, I want to just uh, tell you a few sort of innovations that we've made along this line. Okay, so if you think about the original compressed sensing optimization problem formulation, which is a regularized regression problem formulation, right? Um, it does not rely on fully sampled data. There is no mention of fully sampled data. You just give me a Y, you know what the forward model is, and you're estimating X. And the thing that you engineer essentially is the, um, the regularization term and how you optimize this, right? Um, now, if you look at the deep learning based reconstruction world, the vast majority of techniques actually rely on the assumption that we have lots and lots of training data that is fully sampled, X's. And that includes our work in Loop, for example. Okay. However, there are several applications that um, you can imagine where you, it's, it's, it's impossible to collect fully sampled data. For example, in uh, quantitative susceptibility mapping, I'm told that um, this physically, you can't actually collect fully sampled data. You're, you always have undersampled data to, to start with, okay? So uh, original CS problem formulation does not have a problem with this, right? It can handle just, you give me undersampled data, as long as I have this problem, I can solve it, right? Uh, but deep learning based methods uh, would, would struggle with this if they needed fully sampled data to train on. Um, what we did really recently was we actually took this original formulation and trained a neural network to amortize this optimization problem without the need for fully sampled data, right? So basically, instead of solving this each time we see a new Y, we, saw, we trained a neural network to solve this optimization problem for us by training it on a bunch of Ys, bunch of undersampled data that we've seen before. Okay, so essentially we can take this and amortize that. Now one would expect that this strategy will not be as good as a model that was trained on fully sampled data, right? So a deep learning model that was fully sampled data on, trained on fully sampled data should be able to find, uh, solve the ill pose inverse problem better than this amortization strategy that is not relying on fully sampled training data. And that is true, but this, this model has a distinct advantage, which is robustness. And here's sort of a, a hint at that. Um, if you actually take this model and, you know, we publish this and we call it HQSNet, uh, uh, which stands for, I think HQS stands for quadra, half quadra X splitting, which is inspired by this, it, it's been, because the neural network architecture was inspired by this um, optimization strategy, but the details there are not that important. Um, the, the important thing here is we train it using undersampled data only. And if you look at the performance of this model it, and comparing it to the blue curve here, when there's no, no, no noise at inference time, the quality of the model that was trained with fully sampled data is better than the HQS net. But the moment we have more, no the moment we have noise in our um, inference, at inference time, um, then the um, supervised model's performance drops significantly and is way below the performance of the HQS net, uh, which basically indicates that the unsupervised model is more robust, noise robust. The problem with the unsupervised model is though, what, how do we pick alpha, this hyperparameter? Okay, um, there's other deeper problems like how do we pick this prior term? How do we pick this L2 loss, which I'm going to briefly talk about later. But first of all, how do we pick that hyperparameter? Okay, and everybody who's done any regularized regression or has had to deal with any hyperparameter in neural networks know that this could be a pain in the butt. Okay. Um, and the way you do it is you sort of have to tune it or you have to apply some sort of optimization strategy that sometimes relies on some grid search or whatever. Um, and it's computationally expensive and it's, it's, it's not easy, okay? And so 
Um, but and once you sort of figure out that optimal alpha, let's call it alpha star, um, then you've got a model that's specifically customized for that alpha star. And when you give me new data at test time, um, I can give you a solution that corresponds to that specific alpha star and that alpha star only. Okay. So we wanted to, we thought, you know, we thought this was a problem and and and, and we wanted to sort of avoid this issue. And the way we sort of came around this was to think about this hypernetwork framework. So hypernetworks um, are a relatively new idea in deep learning, where now instead of this main neural network, which could be a unit that solves the problem of interest for you, we have another neural network, a secondary neural network that people, you know, we can refer to as the hyper neural network. This hyper neural network is actually computing the weights of our main network, and the input to this hyper network are the hyperparameters. Okay, so in this in this example, for instance, it's just alpha. Alpha is the input to this hyper network, and for that alpha, this hyper network computes all the different values of our weights uh, in our main network. Okay, so now we can actually think about training. Um, so remember, in this original formulation, we took this CS problem, this regularized regression problem, and amortized it using a, a single neural network architecture for a fixed alpha. Now we can actually amortize it even more by using a hyper network. And so instead of optimizing this for a fixed alpha, we can optimize this for all different alphas uh, that solve this optimization problem for different values of alpha. Okay. So now we've actually double optimized, uh, or uh, sorry, double amortized our optimization problem. And, and the end result is um, we have a main network and a hyper network uh, that after training, if you, if you give me any alpha value, right, and some undersampled data, I can compute the reconstruction uh, uh, output that corresponds to that alpha value. Okay. So we presented these results uh, in a recent Mikai workshop that unfortunately I don't have a lot of time to get into. But uh, one little sort of important detail here is in training this hyper network, it turned out to be important how you sampled the alpha value. So as you train the hyper network, you have to sample <coughs> different alpha values. And if you did that naively and you just drew alpha from a uniform distribution state, um, you actually end up wasting a lot of the capacity of your hyper network on alpha values that you don't really care about in practice. So we sort of came up with a data-driven approach to, to, um, to sample this alpha values. Um, and this is sort of the pseudocode for that. Um, basically what you do is as you're training your reconstruction network, um, you, you draw from your uniform distribution, your alpha values, um, and, but in a mini batch, you only compute back propagate, you only do back propagation and compute gradients only on the top K where K is some hyperparameter um, sort of data, in, uh, data points. Uh, that have the best sort of reconstruction quality. And the best reconstruction quality is based on say data consistency, okay, in our case. Okay, so this is sort of just a, a qualitative uh, observation of the difference between uniform sampling and data-driven sampling. And, and, and we could actually, um, in this case, we've trained um, a, a neural network uh, to solve the compressed sensing MRI problem with two different, um, prior terms. One is the um, total variation prior um, and, sorry, yeah, one is the total variation prior and then the other one was, um, I think, uh, wavelet prior. It was an L1 norm on the wave type. So there was two alphas, alpha one and alpha two. And, um, and we sort of showed that we can get a, a sort of nice results that recapitulates training the neural network uh, training many, many neural networks for all these different alpha one, alpha two combinations, okay, which you can imagine would be computationally very expensive to do, but for our experiment, we had to do. Okay, so here's some examples. So what you do is um, you, in practice, give this model an undersampled um, measurement, right? You feed it in, uh, and for any alpha one, alpha two values, you get different reconstructions. And so as the user, you have the ability to sort of tweak those knobs, right? You can choose any alpha one, alpha two, and it's sort of almost cost-free to get different reconstructions. So you've, we've sort of given the user the ability to sort of explore the space of reconstructions that are consistent with your original measurements and pick the one that you subjectively uh, would prefer. And here's sort of an illustration that you might get two different reconstructions that qualitatively, in terms of just numbers, look you know the same or, or very similar in terms of how they compare to the ground truth reconstruction, but qualitatively, 
um, they look very different, right? So you, if you look at the details of the reconstruction, you know, different anatomical sort of details might be present in one reconstruction versus the other. Okay. How about taking this to a supervised setting? So we said, uh, if we have undersampled data, we're amortizing that optimization problem via hyper networks. But imagine that you gave me fully sampled data. What, what can I use this, this idea, this framework for that problem as well? Well, it turns out we can. Uh, in the context of training deep learning models on fully sampled data, one choice, arbitrary choice that uh, we have is how do we measure that reconstruction loss, whether it's L1 or L2 or SSIM or anything that's more downstream, like the quality of a segmentation. Um, you know, that's sort of arbitrary. And we've sort of recently started to explore uh, the idea of using hyper networks for considering multiple supervised loss functions simultaneously and having hyperparameters that weight them. Okay, and so sort of here's the sort of some preliminary results where we essentially can train a, um, a neural network on fully sampled data, and um, and that is you know optimized for SSIM only or L1 only in the, in a supervised sense, and gives us qualitatively very different results. And and the way we envision this playing out in real world when we deploy this technology is that the user, as I mentioned, will be able to dial the hyperparameter values um, and, and explore the solution of reconstructions that are consistent with the data, um, but corresponds to different hyperparameter value settings um, and, and pick the ones that they, they prefer, prefer. And essentially we're sort of giving the user um, some autonomy in choosing their solution. And in my mind, this, complements really Bayesian sampling very well. So Bayesian sampling, if you think about Bayesian methods, what they want to do is instead of producing a single output result, they want to um, sort of capture the uncertainty in that and, and present multiple samples that are still consistent with the data. Um, there, a lot of that uncertainty is determined by modeling choices. Um, here instead, uh, we actually give a, a knob to the user to explore that uncertainty. Okay. So I just wanted to acknowledge that Chala and Alan are the two students who drove this work. Adrian was a collaborator, an integral collaborator in all of this work. Adrian Dalka, who's at um, MGH and MIT. And um, he was the inspiration behind the use of hyper networks in, 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 this, in this framework. Uh, and this is sort of the funding that, um, that supports the work at our lab. Um, before I forget, I actually really need to um, remind everyone of Melba. Uh, Andreas is involved in this as well, so probably a lot of you know about this, but we um, recently, a little bit over a year ago now, launched this uh, open access journal called Machine Learning for Biomedical Imaging, or MELBA for short, that is an archive overlay journal, and uh, we're hoping it's going to be the state-of-the-art, you know, flagship journal of our field. Um, very excited about that, um, and it's, it's really growing in momentum. And at Cornell, we have this thing called machine learning and medicine, which also has a similar webinar series. Um, and it's sort of an initiative that tries to catalyze collaborations across Cornell's different campuses. And we also have a bunch of publications that describe all the gory details of all the work that I presented today. And the code is also available on GitHub at these, at these links. So with that, I uh, will stop sharing. Bert, thank you very much. This was a brilliant presentation. I learned a lot and I really like the words how you optimize the sampling pattern. This is really cool stuff. And I think quite a few people have been working on running regularizers, but not so many learning the sampling patterns. It's a hard problem. It's a very mm -hmm. elegant solution that you're proposing here. So as you already pointed out, uh, there's it's actually an NP hard problem if you want yes. to do it. And I really like the solution that you're showing here. So this is really cool. So I'm um, um, really, it's really